Yes, the hope of glory. Turn to someone next to you and tell them the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Before we uh, begin tonight and talk about uh, the topic for tonight, I want to kind of give you just a, a brief summary of this series and really the vision behind it and what we're trying to do. Um, this whole series is going to be about this one idea, and that is creating um, a, a stirring within this ministry, a movement within this ministry to join the, the church, our church, Vantage Point Church, and a momentum, a movement that's happening right now. And, and what that's all about is that coming up here at the beginning of November, our church is going to do something that we never have before. Um, it'll probably be the biggest thing that we ever do, and that is build a building on our church property, which is pretty awesome. We have, it's exciting, it's very exciting. We have um, a little over 10 acres, it's about 11 acres on 8500 Archibald. We bought that a couple of years ago and we've been paying it off. And, and starting, um, coming this November, we're going to start a, the Catalyst Initiative is what it's going to be called. And it is, a, it is a building campaign, if you want to call it that, or a fundraiser for our church to put a building on our church property. What this series is all about is letting you know how you can be a part of that. If your parents go to this church, you're going to hear them start talking about it. Um, it's an exciting time in our church because if you didn't know, let me give you a little timeline here. What we're looking at, probably what will happen, is that starting this coming year, 2015, we're going to break ground, start building, and then we are going to be, if all goes well, walking into the doors of our church in December 2016. How awesome is that? It's going to be great. It's going to be outstanding. The bummer is, you guys all got to have to be patient with me, because our building, the Ignite building, is not coming then. It'll probably be, I don't even know, like a year after that. We might still be meeting here. I have no idea. But on Sundays, hey, we're going to be in a building. Um, here, we'll probably continue to meet here somewhere else. I'm not even sure. But the exciting thing is that we will be walking into our church building, um, hopefully, December 2015. So what's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks is we're going to be talking about how you can be a part of that. Next week, we're going to be talking about how to use your gifts, your, your talents, maybe even your, um, your assets God's given you, whether that be money, resources, whatever, to help us build this church building that one day, if you can picture this with me, that one day you'll be able to walk into our church building, to walk into our Ignite building, look around and go, yo, y'all, I, I was a part of this. I was a part of this and this came up because of me. And we're going to be talking about that in the coming weeks. But uh, tonight, what we're going to start by talking about is uh, who are you bringing glory to today? That's where we're going to start. I feel like Really, that's the place we have to start when we talk about um, bringing God glory in the weeks to come and, and, and bringing God glory by putting this church um, on this piece of property. Uh, I, I think we have to start with, with really who are you bringing glory to tonight? Are you bringing God glory or are you seeking to bring your self-glory. We have to start there because otherwise if I start talking to you guys about here's what you can do to bring God glory, if that doesn't matter to you, then there's no sense in even talking about it. So tonight we're going to start with this idea of who are you bringing glory to and why should we bring glory to God? So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, um, go ahead and open them with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is towards the uh, back of your Bibles is after Ephesians and Philippians, you'll find Colossians. Then if you could also open up to um, 2 Corinthians 4, you might be there already, if so, just hold your place. Um, Colossians 1, we're going to read there first, and then 2 Corinthians 4. Colossians 1, 2 Corinthians 4. You don't know if you noticed this, but um, this is something that I've noticed and something that I am personally guilty of, so I confess this to you. I don't know if you've noticed this, but today in our world, we seek to bring glory to ourselves. And I confess, I am guilty of this, I do this all the time, but we seek, if you haven't noticed this, we seek to bring glory to ourselves. We, we live for ourselves, and more specifically, we live for this world. The glory that we seek in life is that everybody around us would tell us that we're awesome. Let me give you an example of this. You ever met someone 
that they, they, when they buy something, which is pretty often, they always want everyone to see it. You know, one of those people, hey, you gotta come over to my house today. They bought a new system, new, you know, new surround sound, or a new TV, or a new Xbox. You gotta come over to my house. Or they're the ones they walk up to, look at the new phone I got. Or they're the ones that roll up at school with a new car, check it out. And, and here's what it's all about. You ever notice this? Look how awesome I am. Doesn't this make you think that I'm more awesome than when you first met me? I mean, they don't say it, but let's be honest. Look at this car, and, and what they're really saying is, look at how awesome I am. And before you start judging people and you're like, you got someone in your head or something like that, let me just show you how we're all guilty of this. Okay, perfect example. What you're wearing tonight, I know this. What you are wearing tonight, you wore it because you thought it made you look sexy. And, and you think that no one... You think that no one figure out, but I know you did. You can tell me, oh no, I don't care. I don't care, but let me, let me, let me paint this picture for you, okay? You wore what you're wearing because you wanted people to think you look good. You wanted people to think you look sexy. In fact, how many of you <laughs> by a raise of hands? By a raise of hands, just be honest. Uh, don't, don't leave me hanging here, just be honest. How many by a raise of hands? Sometimes, it doesn't have to be all the time, but sometimes when you put on your outfit, you ask someone, how do I look? How many of you have done that before? Okay. You can put your hands down. Everybody else, you're liars. That's okay, though. But hey, I'm guilty of this all the time. Here's what I do. I'll go, honey, 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 come here, come here. I bring my wife in the room, and I go, babe, how do I look? <laughs> how do I look? And then she'll be like, oh, you, you look good. And I'll be like, no, no, no. I don't want to know if I look good. I want to know, do I look sexy? I'll tell her, do, when I wear this, does this make you think I'm hot? I honestly, and she'll, she'll roll her eyes and walk away because she's used to me being ridiculous. But, but I really do that. I'm not even exact. You can ask her if you want. I really do that. And it's not because I'm like pathetic. I do it to mess with my wife because I like to do that. But, but I really want to know, do I look good? And here's the thing. Let me tell you what I never do, okay? I'll tell you what I never do. I never go up to my wife and say, honey, does this outfit glorify God? I, I never go, honey, when you look at this, do you think about God? I, I never do that. And you probably never do it. That's just not a question we ask people. Wouldn't that be so awesome to go up to your friends? Hey, um, tell me something. Does this glorify God? And they're like, uh, it makes you look good. And you're like, I didn't ask you if it made me look good. I asked you if it glorified God. I dare you to do that to somebody. Just, just freak them out. But <laughs> we don't think about that. We don't ask that question. It's just not a thought. I'll be honest. I, you guys, I never wake up in the morning and just dress to glorify God. I, I wake up in the morning and I dress to impress people. I want you to go, Chris, where'd you get those shoes if you're a guy? I'll tell you later, Sam. <laughs> I want you to go, Chris, where'd you get that shirt? I want, I want to impress you. I want you to know, and I'm just being honest, so don't judge me, but I think we can all agree. Hey, I want you to, to, I want you to know that I dress to impress. In fact, the person sitting next to you, they're wearing what they're wearing because they wanted you to tell them they look good. So right now, turn to someone next to you and tell them you look good. Tell them that right now. Now, turn to someone, now turn to someone else and tell them if I wasn't in church, I'd ask you for your number. Tell them, tell someone else. <laughs> some of you, some of you are married. Thank you for not asking that question. And uh, for the rest of you that are not, I'm sorry if I got you in trouble from a boyfriend or girlfriend. Hopefully you asked the right person. In fact, just to fix that, just to fix what I just said, turn back to him and say, but I'm not here for you, I'm here for the Lord. Tell him that right now. That'll fix that. So, <laughs> so if we're honest, it's not just about our clothes, right? If we're honest, and, 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 and I really want to encourage you to, to, to let down your guard. I know this is church and we all try to put up a front, but, but let's, let's be a little honest and vulnerable. If we're honest, most days God is not really a thought. 
He's pretty absent from my mind. You might be like, Chris, no. Well, let me take you through a typical, a typical day for yourself. I'm just kind of guessing here. I'm guessing that most of you, your day probably goes like this. You wake up in the morning, and immediately when you wake up, the thoughts start going about you. You wake up, and you're like, oh, crap. I forgot to do my homework last night, that assignment. And you, yes, yeah, see? And then you go, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I forgot. I was just tired. How did I do that? I know what I'll do. And you think like this. You go, I'm going to text Sally from class. I'm going to text Sally because Sally always lets me copy her homework. So you're like, you're like, hey, Sally. Ha, ha, ha. What's up, girl? Everybody knows a Sally in class. Hey, can you meet up with me for class? I got something to tell you. And your plan is to use Sally to copy your homework, because we all know a Sally that's just a sucker in class. And so that's what you do. Then you go to the mirror, right? You go to the mirror, because we all got to know how am I looking today. And then right there in the mirror, staring back at you, is a horrible, no good, very big zit. Right? You look at, you know the kind I'm talking about. You look in and it's just this, this, this huge thing and it's so big. There's so much pressure that if you like sneeze or cough, it's just going to explode. We've all had one, right? Unless your skin's just really good. But most of us, we have, you know what I'm talking about? The Mount St. Helens that's just going to blow. And so you start squeezing from all angles and sometimes you get a squirter which is disgusting but but then after you get over that you you either 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 like on the way to school when you're at school you start thinking to yourself oh I wonder why that person that I'm into is just not into me I wonder if they saw a zit yesterday and they just didn't say anything because I tried talking to them and they weren't talking back and your ma your mind just starts racing about why do they not like me why are they not into me and then you go up to your friends and they're like ah look at your zit I see it and if they're guys right <laughs> if they're girls they, they usually go like this hi and they just like stare and you just know that they know and then when you leave they're like oh my gosh did you see it it was a monster but girls are a little bit nicer but but then at that moment if, if you're anything like I used to be you're like you know what I just want to go home I just want to call it a day right and here's what's so sad we're so and hang with me on this we're so into ourselves that if the day is not our day, if the day is not bringing us glory as we think it should, we want it to be over. God, just cancel this day. Just, I want to move on to the next one. Why? Because it wasn't about us. Because if it's not going spectacular, we're like, God, I, I don't know why you're picking on me today, but I'd really appreciate if I move on to tomorrow, because today is not about me, so I don't like it. It's sad, but it's true. Most days, if we're honest, God is not even a thought. And you probably lay your head down on your pillow at night sometimes and go, wow, I didn't even think about God once today. You feel guilty. You start crying. <laughs> Forgive me. And then you do the same thing tomorrow. But, but the, the truth is, hey, sometimes you have good days. Sometimes you think about God. Sometimes you pray. Sometimes you read your Bible, but let's be honest. I mean, most days we are pretty selfish. Most days, if we're honest, it's all about us. It's all about bringing glory to ourselves. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says this. Let's read it together. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, it'll be up on the screen for you. Verse 27, verse 27 says this. To them to them being all Christians, to them being everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You've, you've confessed him as Lord. If you've done that, God's talking to you. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, Gentiles being people who don't believe in God, to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everybody say the hope. Of glory Christ in you and Christ in me is the hope of glory the fact 
that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a cross and he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and hell. And the fact that today he is alive in you and alive in me, the fact that Christ is in me and Christ is in you, this is the hope of glory. And here's why. That is, that is Christ is in you and he's working out your salvation and you're becoming more and more like him. What you're doing is you're bringing glory to God as Christ works in you. And the idea of why this is so important, why it's called the hope of glory, is because as Christians we have a hope. And the hope is that one day we will, and this will happen, that we will stand before the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the King Himself, before a multitude of saints in heaven, and before the Father God Himself, and we will receive the reward for the glory that we have brought God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That that's the hope. That what you're doing matters. And it doesn't just matter because of this world. It doesn't just matter because, oh, the Bible tells me to do it, and I know I'm supposed to. But it matters because, listen, because you're going to be rewarded for it. That for eternity, you will reap the fruit of the, of the, of the work that you've done for Christ. That as Christ has worked in you, that forever, for, for all eternity, you will see the glory that you brought God as he shows everyone what you did. The one day they're going to call my name, Chris Karras. I'm going to be like, yeah, and I'm going to run to the front and I hope you'll be clapping for me. You probably will. And he's going to be like, this is what Chris did for me. That one day he's going to call your name and you're going to go to the front of the multitude of saints and he will tell them the glory you brought God through him. That is Christ is in you. You bring glory to God. And you might be one of those guys or one of those girls, you know what, Chris, I'm just a failure with this. I, I fail God all the time. I'm just, I'm one of those Christians. I just can't get it right. Well, listen, that this is what it looks like. That as Christ is in you, if you've truly accepted him, then Christ is in you, and, and as he's speaking to you, which I know he will if he's in you, if you've accepted him, as he's trying to work in your life, that you would let him that you would let Christ make you more and more like him. And the idea and the hope of that glory is this, that someone will come up to you and go, yo, Billy, you and I used to smoke a lot of pot, but you never come around anymore. What's up? And you go, yeah, man, um, I'm, I'm not into that anymore. And they'd be like, Billy, you know what? We used to have so much fun. I thought we had fun. Why don't you come around anymore? And you'd be like, you know what, dude? Um, I kind of had fun for a while, but I got something better. Let me tell you about Jesus let me tell you about Christ in me. You know what, dude? Why don't you come with me to church and I'll show you what I have and what's been going on. You see, sin is fun or no one would do it. People smoke weed because they have fun when they do it. People drink before they're 21 and get drunk because it's fun or no one would do it. People have sex before marriage because it's fun or no one would do it. But here's what maybe no one's told you before. It's empty. It never leaves you satisfied. You always want more and more and more. And maybe you never think about this, but, but I'm not trying to embarrass you or make you feel stupid, but I just want you to think about this logically with me. Where are you headed? Is your plan to be a pot smoker as your profession? They have a name, they're called drug dealers, and you can do it and make some money, but you'll also, you're also gonna go to jail. It's just a matter of time before that happens. What's your, what's your goal with sex? Are you, are, are you on your way to being a porn star? Because you'll get paid for that, but along with that comes STDs, comes with losing your soul in the process and numbing yourself to the most beautiful gift that God's given us as human beings in, in, in love with each other, with a man and a woman. I mean, you can head down that direction, that path, but, but where are you headed? Maybe you don't ever think about that. And you see, here's the idea. You can live for yourself bringing yourself glory, or you can leave for God and bring him glory. But at the end of the day, here's where your path is headed. Think about where you're headed. And guess what? When you die, all the pleasure dies with you. But the hope of glory for us as Christians, the beauty of Christianity is what we do we take with us in eternity. That what we do, not only does it matter today, but we will take it with us for the rest of eternity. That is the hope 
of glory. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says this, um, in him, meaning in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, Christians, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Did you notice at the beginning um, in verse 11, it says that word again, um, if you pull back up 11 for us, it says chosen, that you as a Christian were chosen, that you were predestined. That word chosen also showed up in Colossians 1. And here's the idea, um, that if God chose you, homie, if he chose you and saved you, he wants you to know that it has nothing to do of because, because of like the fact that you were such a swell guy. It has nothing to do with the fact that you were so awesome, that God saved you and that he chose you to bring himself glory because of who he is, not because of who you are. That for you, Chica, for you, young lady, as a sister in Christ, that you would know this, that he didn't choose you because you were some perfect little angel. He chose you not because of who you are, but because who he is. And you see, here's the idea of being chosen by God. It's this idea of something called predestination. Um, predestination is often called Calvinism, and people often do not believe in it because they don't understand it. But I want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page tonight. Hopefully, um, you'll understand more about what predestination looks like after tonight. Um, but this is what I believe. I would call myself, if you want to call it this, a Calvinist. I do believe in predestination, but maybe you don't understand what it means. So I want to explain it to you tonight. And here's what I want to say, first of all, this is a super, super deep subject. And so if you don't understand it, come see me after. If you have questions, come see me after. But I'm going to do my best to explain it to you in just a moment because we don't have a lot of time. But here's a basic idea of predestination. A lot of people don't understand what it means. Predestination is this that you are incapable of choosing God, God chose you. You did not choose God, God chose you. And, and I get it, because I used to think this too. Chris, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I made the decision to follow Christ. That was me. I chose God. But you see, you didn't. Let me explain it so hopefully it makes more sense. God called you, and you answered his call. He saved you, and you received him as your savior. You didn't go to him and you didn't call on him. He came to you and he saved you. That is what predestination looks like. That you say, I cannot choose God. I'm incapable of it. He chose me. Because you see, the Bible tells us this, not just in these two verses. It does say in these two verses that you were chosen, that you were predestined. Go to 1 Peter. It'll also tell you that you were predestined before the foundations of the world. You were his elect and so on and so forth. But not only does the Bible say that, but the Bible also says this, that you and I were born as sinners. Thank you, Adam and Eve. We are born as sinners and all throughout our lives, we have sin, that, that in our very nature, we have a sinful nature, we are selfish by nature, we are evil by nature. That's what the Bible tells us. And I get it. You're probably like, Chris, no, 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 no. See, I'm not a Christian tonight, but I have a good heart. And you might say about some, even if you're a Christian tonight, you might say, hey, Chris, Chris I know some, some non-Christians, and they have good hearts. They're good people, even though they're not Christians. So I believe, you know, hey, that the, you can be a good person. Well, I think that all depends on what you call a good person. I think that all depends on what you call good. And I hope you understand this. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm not trying to belittle you, make you feel stupid. I'm trying to make you think with me about this logically. So imagine this for a second. One example. Adolf Hitler, let's say he rescued 15 Jews, okay? He, he let them go, he released them in mercy, in, in, in a good heart, in a moment of conscience, he released them. Would that have been called good? Absolutely. He did something good. He did something merciful. But that doesn't change the fact that he also killed six million Jews and many, many more. And you see, just because we make a few decisions that are good, it doesn't change who we are and everything we've done. Let me give you a different example. I could wear a wig and I could start wearing a purse 
I could start wearing dresses and start talking in a female voice, but it would not change the fact that scientifically speaking, I'm still a male if you follow what I'm saying. And you see, you can make certain decisions and you can act a certain way, but it doesn't change who you are. And we are by nature sinful, selfish, evil people. Last example, people do this all the time. I know a lot of cops. They say, don't give me a ticket. I'm a law-abiding citizen. But you just broke the law by speeding. You're not laughing because you don't, haven't probably got a ticket yet. But uh, see, we like to think that, hey, I'm a law-abiding citizen, so don't give me a ticket. But the truth is you just broke the law by speeding. And here's the reality, that if you break one of the laws, you're a breaker of the entire law. And every single person in this room has broken one of the laws in the United States. For example, if you jaywalked against the law, you probably don't know what that means. That's okay. Uh, speed, that's against the law. Run a stop sign, against the law. Stole from 7-Eleven, against the law. Um, I could go on and on, but the idea is if you break one, you're a breaker of the entire law. If you sin once, you've sinned against the entire law, and this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. All of us are sinners. All of us are guilty, and back to my original point, you are incapable of choosing God. He chose you. To say, Chris, no, 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 no. I chose God is to say, Chris, I didn't need to be saved, which you did. To say, Chris, I, I, I don't need, I didn't, I didn't need God to choose me. I chose him. I made that decision. That's to say, I never needed Jesus to save me from my sins, but you did. And never forget this. It was Jesus that came to you it was Jesus who spoke to you. It was Jesus who saved you from your sins. You merely received him. You answered his call. You didn't call him, he called you. You didn't go to him, he went to you. Or maybe you've forgotten the gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What did Jesus do? He went to Matthew and what did he say? Follow me. He went to Peter and said, follow me. He went to John and said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They didn't call him, he called them. In fact, read the Gospels and you'll also see people came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. You know what he said to them? You can't. You can't follow me. He'd tell them that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. They'd say, Jesus, I want to follow you, but let me go bury my father first. And he would say, let the dead bury their own dead. As for you, come follow me. And they'd turn around and they'd walk away. Jesus chose his followers just like he chooses us. But here's the, here's the thing people often misunderstand. People often think that God, that this whole idea of predestination is based on randomness. That God's like, okay, uh, heaven, hell, heaven, hell. Eeny, meeny, money, mo. It doesn't work like that. The Bible tells us it's based on knowledge. That God knows us, therefore he chooses us. Let me give you an example. That God knows your life from start to end. And because he knows your life and who you are, and whether you truly love him, whether you've truly accepted him, he chooses you based on knowledge. Those who he knows, he chooses. And you might remember that Jesus said, in that day, meaning in the day that I come back for my church, for Christians, for those that love me, he says what? That some will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, why not us? Why not me? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not preach in your name? Did we not read our Bibles and blah, blah, blah? And what did Jesus say? Away from me, I never knew you. That many will claim to know him, but he knows you and he chooses off of that knowledge. It's not random. It's off of who you are. He knows you. And the idea is this, bringing it back to our series, because you might be like, Chris, what does this have to do with the hope of glory? Well, doesn't it make sense that if God chose you, he has a plan for you? That if God chose you, he has a purpose for you. That if you're saved, along with that comes a purpose. That, that one day the king will return. But my question to you is this tonight, are you ready for his coming? I get this, that this is like a, a difficult question to answer for us as Christians, right? Because we're like, okay, I think, and, and, and more often than not, I think we often doubt our salvation. So it's, it's tough to answer. So let me put it to you a different way. 
If you knew for sure, for, for absolute certainty, that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, would that change what you did today? If you knew without a doubt in your mind that, that Jesus was coming back tomorrow to take those who were ready home to be with him forever, for eternity, would that change the decisions you made today? Because if so, the first thing I would do if I were you tonight is ask myself this question. Am I ready for the king? Because if, if I found out he's coming tomorrow, then that would change what I do today, then obviously I'm not ready if he came today. That if he came today, it would come with shame, not with joy. This is an important question. And just so we're all clear, this isn't to scare you. This is a promise from Jesus, a promise. I will return. I'm just trying to make sure we're all ready. I'm not trying to scare you, spook you. It's a promise, and this is what I want you to do. Search your heart tonight. Am I ready? If I would do something different today, knowing he'd come tomorrow, maybe I'm not ready for the coming of the king. Did you know that Jesus uses this example, this, this, this phrase, this name for himself to illustrate how we should always be ready for him? He calls himself something very strange. You might, you might remember this. Jesus says, I will come at my second coming, when he comes back to take us home, I will come like a thief in the night. What a strange saying. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. It sounds kind of weird, kind of scary, honestly. A thief in the night, that sounds kind of spooky. Well, um, I remember when I was in Bible college, I'll never forget this one class I took, where this guy um, actually broke this verse down for us, this idea of Jesus calling himself a thief in the night when he comes back for us. And did you know this? that this name, Thief in the Night, was not a new name. This was something the Jews that Jesus was talking to when he said, I'll come like a thief in the night. It was a name they were very familiar with. You see, back at that time, they had these things called festivals. And this is fascinating. I think you're going to love this. It blew my mind. They had these things called festivals back then. And there was this one festival that was a new moon festival. And here's how it worked. Let's say you were one of the people in the Jewish town. You might be one night chosen as the night watchman. And here was, your, here was your purpose as a night watchman. You would watch the night skies, and when the moon changed, you would announce it with a trumpet. The, 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 the festival began and when the moon changed. That was your job as the night watchman. You would stay up at night, and when the moon changed, you would da 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 But here's the thing. There was a Jewish name for the people who made sure that the night watchmen were watching. And the name translated into English is the thief in the night. And what they would do is they would wander around at night when you're supposed to be watching, and get this, this is crazy. If they caught you sleeping, they would set you on fire. Whoa. And, you're, and two things happen. First of all, whoa, <laughs> ouch. But second, you would be, your clothes would most likely burn off, exposing your nakedness and your shame. It was such a big deal that if they caught you sleeping, they'd set you on fire, shaming you before, because you'd say, ah, the whole village wakes up, you're naked, ah, they know what happened. So, so this is what Jesus is trying to communicate with us. I am that thief in the night. I will come back. I am watching you. Jesus once gave this, um, this story that he once told to his disciples to kind of illustrate how we should always be ready for his coming. And we find it in Matthew chapter 25. I want to read it for you. It's not going to be up on the screen. I, I believe it's powerful enough to just hear it. And I want you to imagine this, that Jesus is, is preaching to you tonight. Um, and this is a story Jesus told him. Because they asked Jesus, how will we know when your second coming is about to happen? Jesus, what should we do to prepare for that? And this was his answer to them. Jesus says, at that time, meaning at the time that I come back, my second coming, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Pause. Okay, weird, right? Ten virgins, what does that even mean? Well, these ten virgins represent ten bridesmaids. Notice it said at the end, um, they went out to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom is the groom, like in a wedding, a groom and a, and a bride, right? 
So they went out as bridesmaids, 10 of them, to meet the groom. Here's what this is all about, because I get that that doesn't make any sense. For some reason back then, 10 was like, a, like an important number to the Jewish people. So 10 was most likely your bridesmaids. Um, it almost happened every time like that. You had 10, 10 bridesmaids. And almost always, they were unmarried. They were virgins, which is why Jesus says 10 virgins. So most likely, they were always a virgin because they were not married. And so 10 bridesmaids go out to wait for the groom. What, what does that even matter? What, are they talk, what is Jesus talking about? Well, back then... If you propose to a woman, guys, you would then leave, not see her again, as you went to prepare a place for her. So you would go build a house or you would go um, buy a house. And when that place was prepared for your family, you would go back and the wedding would start. And it was a seven-day wedding, which is pretty cool. Um, and you would go back and the wedding would start when the place has been prepared. So the bridesmaids would wait for the groom to come back so that the wedding would come. And so Jesus says that the 10 virgins or the 10 bridesmaids went out with lamps, so it's nighttime, waiting for the groom because they probably heard, oh, the groom's coming, the wedding's about to happen, so they went out to wait for him. Verse 2, uh, Jesus says, five of them were foolish. And five were wise. So he divides them in half. Five were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Then the bridegroom was a long time in coming. He, he took a while. So guess what happened? They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, Jesus says, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil quick or our lamps are going to go out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But Jesus says, but while they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, Jesus says, keep watch because you do not know the day or day the hour. Jesus wanted us to understand something. And I know this is heavy, and I know that this is impactful and all that, but I don't want you to miss this. Jesus is trying to, in love, warn us. Yes, there's a test, but he's giving you the answers ahead of time so you can pass. He wants you to be there. So he's warning us if you love this world, he will give you exactly what you want. When he comes back to take those who love him and are ready for him, guess what? He will leave you to the world that you loved so much. He's not going to take it from you. He's going to leave you to the world that you treasured so much. But if you love him, if, if it's all about his glory, which it can become tonight, if it's not yet, it can become that, then he will take you home to be with him. One more verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our highlight verse for this series. It says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart. As some of you might have done recently, you've lost heart as a Christian. You want to give up as a Christian. Don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. That you can come into a place like this at church and be renewed in your faith, even though outwardly you're still dying in your body. Inwardly your spirit is being renewed by Jesus Christ. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on all the stuff around you, not on your Xbox, not on your girlfriend or your boyfriend, not on the things that are seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 
that, that, that the decisions we make today, that Christ in us is the hope of glory because of the fact that we are living for a cause that lasts for eternity, that the glory we bring God will echo in eternity, that we'll carry it with us and receive reward for it and be able to enjoy it for the rest of eternity. That's why we don't focus on the things that are seen, but on what is unseen. And I want to challenge you one more time with that question. If, if you knew that tomorrow would be that day, would that change what you do today? Because if so, this is what tonight is all about for you. I really believe this. That tonight was about you coming here so that for the very first time, you would have that opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, to repent from your life, to know where you're going and know the hope of glory and know Christ in you. Or maybe for you it's the fact that a long time ago you made that decision, but the truth is you represent those five foolish bridesmaids. Did you notice that Jesus divided them in half? Did you notice that? Five and five. Five were wise, five were foolish. It's funny that the, the, the five that the Bible says are foolish, the literal translation of that Greek word is stupid. That there were five stupid and there were five wise and that five of you, that some of you might be the five stupid, not to be mean, but, but, but here's the idea, that Jesus divided them. And here's what's kind of scary about that. Not to read into it too much, I don't know this for sure, but it's inter interesting to me that, that Jesus divided them and here's why. I think that it's possible, not for sure, but I think that it's possible that Jesus was giving us a picture of that day. The day that he comes back, that half are going up, but half are not. Not saying that's for sure, I'm just saying it's interesting that he divided them in half. Five were wise, five were what he called stupid or unprepared. You know what else is interesting? Those five that were called stupid, understand this, it's not like they showed up in their pajamas. They showed up dressed for the wedding. They, they were all done up. They, they, their hair was did, girlfriend. They had their hair did, makeup and all that. They had their lamp. They just didn't have the oil. They were, from outward appearances, ready. But the one thing you couldn't see, the oil to fuel the lamp, the one thing that only God could see, Jesus pointed out. Yeah, they were ready on outward appearances, but they didn't have any oil. What does the oil represent? It represents true salvation. Because remember, this is a warning about Jesus coming back. The oil is representing true salvation. In other words, this, that five truly loved him, that five were truly ready, that five were truly prepared, that it wasn't just about outward appearances that, hey, some of us, like all of us in here, you know, we put on the good Christian front, but, but although we all may look the same on the surface, that God will divide based on the heart, based on knowledge that he knows you and he divides based on that. And that, that there, and I hope this God speak, that God speaks to you through this, that there are some of us that are unprepared right now. There are some of us not ready and there are some of us that are. Here's what tonight's all about, making sure that you're ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God. Um, we thank you for the fact that your son, that you, God, love us enough to warn us, to, to make sure, God, that there is, um, there is no doubt. Jesus, you're coming back for us. Not only, Jesus, did you come to this earth and die for us on a cross and raise again, but Jesus, you did all that so that as you left this earth, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would be in each and every one of us. That Christ could be in me, that Christ could be in every single person in this room. Jesus, you made this possible and we thank you for it, God. We thank you for the cross tonight. We thank you for the fact that you love us enough to tell us what's coming to warn us 
of what's coming because you love us that much. And Father, we want to receive it in love. We don't want to receive it in, in anger and walk out of here feeling judged, but, but we receive it in love. Help us to do that, God, that, that it would humble us today, that we would come honestly before you, that for someone whose heart has been against you, that it would be, it would be broken by you tonight. God, just do what only you can do. Father, we, um, we love you, and um, we thank you that us being saved has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with you. That you call us by your grace, and it is by that grace that divides us, that if that grace is within us, that if we have accepted you as Lord and Savior, we're ready. We love you, God, so much, and we praise you in your name. Everybody say, amen.